Anarchistic Socialism, Against All Monopolies, and the State Their Source This brings us to anarchism, which may be described as the doctrine that all the affairs of men should be managed by individuals or voluntary associations, and that the state should be abolished. When Warren and Perdone, in prosecuting their research for justice to labor, came face to face with the obstacle of class monopolies, they saw that these monopolies rested upon authority, and concluded that the thing to be done was not to strengthen this authority, and thus make monopoly universal, but to utterly uproot authority, and give full sway to the opposite principle, liberty, by making competition the antithesis of monopoly universal. They saw in competition the great leveler of prices to the labor cost of production, and this they agreed with the political economists. The query then naturally presented itself why all prices do not fall to labor cost, where there is any room for income acquired otherwise than by labor, in a word, why the user, the receiver of interest, rent, and profit exists. The answer was found in the present one-sidedness of competition. It was discovered that capital had so manipulated legislation that unlimited competition is allowed in supplying productive labor, thus keeping wages down to the starvation point, or as near as practical that a great deal of competition is allowed in supplying distributive labor or the labor of the mercantile classes, thus keeping not the prices of good, but the merchants acting profits on them down to a point somewhat approximating equitable w wages for merchants' work, but that almost no competition at all is allowed in supplying capital, upon the aid of which most productive and distributive labor are dependent for the power of achievement, thus making the rate of interest on money and of house rent and ground rent at as high a point as necessity of the people will bear. On discovering this, Warren and Perdone charged the political economist with being afraid of their own doctrine. The Manchester men were accused of being inconsistent. They believed in liberty to compete with the laborer in order to reduce his wages, but not in liberty to compete with the capitalist in order to reduce the, his usury. Laissez-faire was very good sauce for the goose, labor, but was very poor sauce for the gander, capital. But how to correct this inconsistency? How to serve this gander with the sauce? how to put capital in the service of businessmen and labor at cost or free of usury. That was the problem. Marx, as we have seen, solved it by declaring capital to be a different thing from product and maintaining that it belonged to society and should be seized by society and employed for the benefit of all alike. Proudhon scoffed at this distinction between capital and product. He maintained that capital and product are not different kinds of wealth, but simply alternate conditions or functions of the same wealth that all wealth undergoes an incessant transformation from capital into product and from product back into capital. The process repeating itself intermittently, that capital and product are purely social terms, that what is product to one man immediately becomes capital to another, and vice versa. That if there were but one person in the world, all wealth would be to him at once capital and product, and the fruit of A's toll in his product, which then sold to B, becomes B's capital. Unless B is an unproductive consumer, in which case it is merely wasted wealth, outside the view of social economy. That is a steam engine is just as much product as a cost, and that a cost is just as much capital as a steam engine, and that the same laws of equity govern the possession of the one that govern the possession of the other. For these and other reasons, Perdone and Warren found themselves unable to sanction any such plan as the seizure of capital by society. But though opposed to socializing the ownership of capital, they aimed nevertheless to socialize its effects by making its use beneficial to all instead of means of impoverishing the many to enrich the few. And when the light burst in upon them, they saw that this could be done by subjecting capital to the natural law of competition, thus bringing the price of its own use down to cost. That is, to nothing beyond the expensive incidental to handling and trans transferring it. So they raised the banner of absolute free trade, free trade at home as well as within the foreign countries, the logic carrying out that the M Manchester Doctrine laissez-faire, the universal rule. Under this banner, they began their fight upon monopolies, whether the all-inclusive monopoly or the state socialists or the various class monopolies that, that now prevail. Of the latter, they distinguished four of principal importance, the money monopoly, the land monopoly, the tariff monopoly, and the patent monopoly.